Thank you, Tim. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm going to share some slides as we go along uh, just to help uh, understanding. So today I'm going to talk about light healing. Uh, and I'm going to begin by talking about light from an esoteric point of view. Uh, light is really light and consciousness are one and the same. So when we talk about light esoterically, we're talking about consciousness and levels of consciousness and amounts of consciousness. So I particularly like um, this quote from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, that the nature of the soul is light and that light is the great revealer. So the yogi through steady practice and meditation has reached the point where he can at will turn the light which radiates from his very being in any direction and can illumine any subject. So nothing can therefore be hid from him and all knowledge is at his disposal. So this is the idea of the light of that light is understanding to know what stands under and that it is illuminating. It is illumination, a sudden understanding, a realization, a lifting of your consciousness because you've opened up to something beyond. And then if we look at the initiations uh, in theosophy, this is really, if we look at this as increasing light radiating through the being or increasing soul contact and increasing ability of that light of the soul to radiate through the whole being of the individual and out into the world. So we think of the first initiation as really developing the soul, developing control over the physical body. Uh, and this will be very different for different people, um, the way it plays out, the different things they have to overcome. There's the birth of the Christ consciousness here. So an awakening of the heart center. Um, and there's a lot of karma involved in this first initiation. And I believe that current world events, that this first, this will be, uh, there'll be many people taking this first initiation as a result of what's going on in the world at the moment. And then there are many lives usually between the first and second initiation, because the second is where the soul starts to have control over the emotional astral body. Uh, and this is through crisis after crisis and increasingly being able to lift up out of the personal desire nature. There is the death of the personal desire nature. And there's emergence from just me, myself and I into a desire for the good of the whole. And we see the emergence of the practice of service and lifetimes of service through the second initiation. The throat center is vivified. And as this person, this personality increasingly goes forth in service. Often the progress, once the second initiation is reached, often the progress is quite rapid. Uh, and sometimes the second and third initiations can be taken in one lifetime. So the third initiation is really where the entire personality is flooded with light. They become a soul infused personality and this light from above, from the higher self, but it's beyond the higher self. This is light that is coming from the monad. Uh, the individual has control over the mind the mental body. And this is really, uh, we're seeing this in the world today, this is control over fear. That's the big one here, the capacity to lift up out of fear into the discriminative mind. The person becomes a master of their self um, and they develop uh, the full blossoming of the intuitive, the buddhic nature. And this is the ability to um, understand the light, the light of the intellect is vivified, but there's also the ability to understand or realize what stands under the totality of forms. There's a withdrawal from the emphasis on form life. 
um, and an increasing expression of the Christ principle within. So we get an increasing expression of that Christ consciousness and the development of a capacity for love in the heart. And this is not just affectionate or sentimental love or the possession of a loving disposition. No, this is true love that, that negates all barriers that would create separation. And it's a grasp of this synthetic inclusiveness um, of all of life and the needs of all beings. So um, I would describe it as learning as being love rather than being in love. So the, the, the nature is love and that love just pours forth as the soul has a free expression through the personality. So the personality becomes very magnetic. Um, and what happens in the brain around the pineal gland, uh, cells that were dormant become awakened uh, and vibrant and they become something they talk about a light in the head. Um, and what we find is the nucleus of every cell in the body, and this is a change in the vibration, because remember, light, sound, these are just energy vibrations. And obviously, sound we pick up through our hearing and light we pick up through our eyes. But it's still based on the premise that all of uh, life is based on energy of different vibrations. So this cell light, every cell in the body starts to respond to the light of the soul. And there's a continuance, there's a, it's almost like the intuition becomes uh, infused in the physical body. Uh, and it's interesting that science has now found that each of our cells in our body are actually photoelectric. And so they respond to light and depending on your diet will determine the cell wall or the cell membrane that you have, the different fats we eat determines how freely that light penetrates the cell. And this is one of the reasons why a vegetarian diet, it tends to make the cells in your body able to absorb light more easily. But what happens, this is why um, in past times, yogis have been said to have existed on light because their cells have been able to absorb light as a source of fuel and keep the body nourished and functioning. So we know now our cells are photoelectric, and I'm going to talk a little bit more um, in a bit about how sunlight affects us physically because that natural full spectrum light is able to be absorbed into the very cell, all of the cells in our body. So this um, third initiation, the personality vibration is of a very high order. Uh, the mental body or the mind becomes increasingly an instrument that the initiate can safely wield uh, and wisely use the increasing psychic abilities that um, develop in helping the race. Okay, so as we get more light, we get um, effects on especially the third eye, and we tend to get clairvoyance, often clear audience, and definitely clear sentience develops. And there's an increasing ability to create with the power of thought and an increasing understanding of the ability to create with the power of thought and really that energy follows thought and able to direct and use um, that axiom. So this is, as we move through the levels, um, the, the person's vibration is increasing. Um, they're increasingly filled with light and they will physically feel lighter. There'll be a lightness about them and they will be able to almost lightly dance through the challenges of life. There's less dense energy, less heaviness. So when we look at this through Raja Yoga, um, where yoga means union, uh, Raja Yoga is considered the highest form of yoga and it is really yoga of the mind. And this is the ability to hold the mind steady in the light and to achieve a right outlook and right mental altitude. 
So notice that is altitude, not attitude. So this is a lifting of the mental facility up above to see a bigger picture, to see things differently. We see it in the Buddhic Noble Eightfold Path is based on this principle that increasing light brings about right living. And we're given um, qualities that develop through that Eightfold Path. We also see it as increasing Christ consciousness. And there are many, many references in the Bible and other uh, Christian writings about the principle of life and love being depicted as light. I'm the light of the world. The idea that forgiveness is the light of truth. The idea that as we let our light shine, so we help others to do the same. Um, as Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So we're starting to get an idea that light is more than just the vis visible spectrum, what we see through our physical eyes, that really light is consciousness. And to spiritualize matter is to infuse it with greater light, to raise its vibrational frequency. And it's like if you look at the chakra system in our body, these vortices, and people often don't realize that each chakra in your body, as you spiritually develop naturally, is able to take in more energy so that the etheric body is able to handle energies of increasing vibration and increasing potency that if those centers were open prematurely, there would be a burning, um, a negative effect in the etheric body. But as the spiritual progress is made and the development of, of control of the emotional desire nature, the opening of the throat, the development of the mind and that switching on of the light in the head, then increasingly the physical body is able to handle um, and direct out into the world those very high potency, high vibrational energies until eventually when we become what's called fully realized or fully opened, we become enlightened. So there is no aspect that is not radiating that light of the soul. This is to be fully lightened. Um, and there is a, a raising of the vibration. At this point, we're barely physical, <laughs> okay? Um, and that is when there is starts to be a preparation to move on to other realms and maybe no longer a need to, well, no, definitely no longer a need, but may no, that person may no longer incarnate back down on the much denser vibration here down on earth. So if we move into the idea of light from an esoteric healing point of view, um, esoteric healing works on the premise that 90% of dis-ease in our body is caused by a lack of soul expression. So there's some kind of block or some kind of lack of soul light light that soul expression is not able to come through. And really the healing process involves throwing light on that which is preventing full soul expression. And um, I, I've done full talks on esoteric healing and I would recommend that you go and watch those on YouTube if you want to understand this more. But just a couple of examples. Um, we, uh, many people on the planet at the moment are very polarized in their emotional body and their emotional desire body. That's what runs the show, if you like. And as, as we develop ca the capacity to shine the conscious light into the unconscious mind and pull out that which is um, determining our behavior, that which needs healing, uh, increasingly we, we heal that emotional body, we heal the issues, we 
unblock the flow. And this is part of the process of using the mind to um, take control or allow the soul to have control over the emotional body. Another example of dis-ease often occurs, especially inflammation, when there's friction between the personality and the soul, when there's a resistance to your soul path, to the natural urging of your soul in a certain direction. Uh, and sometimes oh. the, the healing, the dis-ease process is part of the healing. Inflammation is created, for example, when chakra energy centers open um, or start to receive more energy, or sometimes if they're too open or too closed, they're not receiving an ideal amount of energy. This um, energy, because the etheric body is vivifying the physical body, this works through into the meridian, it will wind up with inflammation through the meridian systems. And as they integrate with the glandular system and we get um, disease resulting. So just before I move on to a more scientific view of light and light healing, I just want to talk a little bit more about um, the idea of, of the light of truth and its capacity to heal. And I talked a bit about this yesterday in a talk I did um, on the Christ consciousness and the Course in Miracles. And the idea is that when you get a, when you um, have any kind of a conflict, uh, and I'll give the example I gave yesterday. So, say anger has been triggered in your emotional body, and if we start to see anger as information, okay, this is valuable information. Anger means something in me has not needs healing. There's something in me has been triggered, something in my unconscious mind. And because I'm responding with anger, um, A Course in Miracles would say that I, it's due to a misperception of a situation. Now, if we think of the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, the conscious mind, it's like an iceberg. So the conscious mind is the small amount of the iceberg that is floating above the water. It's what we're consciously aware of. But down below the water, where we're not aware, is a vast, uh, much larger part of the iceberg. And as we raise our consciousness, as we become more self-aware, more consciously aware, what we're really doing is we're shining the light of awareness or we're using our mind to look down into that unconscious mind, find the aspects that need healing and bring them into the conscious light of day. So we're increasing the iceberg that's above the water. And as we do that, that is one of the main ways that we develop spiritually and especially develop the control over the emotional desire nature. Because in your unconscious mind, most of the values and the conditionings and the programs and the ways of viewing the world and your beliefs, they were laid down from age zero to seven in whatever situation, family situation you were in in those years, you took on, you were like a sponge taking on information about the world and developing programs and beliefs and values that enabled you to survive. Uh, and you would probably agree with me in saying zero to seven, our perception and understanding of the world and especially the interrelationships between people is not very well developed. We don't have much emotional intelligence at that age. So most of those programs in our unconscious mind that are triggered by other people, by events in our life, are not necessarily programs that give a true perception of a situation. So going back to the anger, someone has done something or said something and I've responded with anger. So you could say that the child in me, the five-year-old in me, has responded uh, to that situation with anger because they're seeing it. They're, it it's triggered that um, 
response that is in my unconscious mind. Now, when we are mindful and aware and conscious, our conscious mind is running the show. As soon as we start thinking and we get lost in thoughts, everyday thoughts, our unconscious mind takes over. That's why you can drive somewhere and you can not even remember. You know you didn't hit anything. You know you went the way you were supposed to, but you can't remember the journey because the whole time you were driving, you were thinking. So your unconscious mind, which has lots of programs in there for driving, took over. If you suddenly had to break, oh, the conscious mind comes back in and you're reacting and you're like straight back into this moment. So when we are mindful, we are working with the conscious mind. When we're off in thoughts, our unconscious mind, the zero to seven year old takes over. And the idea is that when we take a situation and I take that anger and I think, okay, what is it in me that was sparked? Why did I become angry? How can I heal this? How can I shine my consciousness into this anger and understand it, illuminate it and heal it? And what we can do is we can go into meditation. We can use other practices. There's many practices that enable us to go deep into the unconscious. And when we see the truth of a situation, we suddenly realize that that person was doing their best, that they're human just like us, that we played a part in that conflict, that we misperceived it and they didn't mean what we thought they meant. And we get that moment of, ah, oh, and we see it clearly, that's the opportunity to heal and change that program in the unconscious mind, to shine light into that and bring it into our conscious awareness. And in that moment, we have a choice. We've had the illumination, so we've seen the truth. And the next thing we can do is we can lift that energy, that anger was in the solar plexus chakra, we can lift it up into the heart and we can transcend that anger by coming to a place of, first of all, acceptance of what's happened and secondly, forgiveness. And uh, we talked last night quite a lot about forgiveness. Um, I haven't got time to do that here today, but when we lift up into forgiveness, we return to a connection, we return to love, and we return to a connection with the consciousness of all. We return to a connection with our soul. We see things in truth. Um, so I just wanted to bring that in because any, any talk on light healing has got to involve this consciousness, this light that, that goes on in our mind when we see a truth, when we intuitively know a truth, when we, we sense that illumination. So starting to look at it from more um, of a scientific point of view, we have this spectrum. This is the whole light spectrum. And this tiny bit in here is visible light. This is what we see through our eyes. And we have all the colors and all the colors merged together creates white light. Uh, at a at increasing the vibration increases this way. Okay, so if slightly increasing vibration would be ultraviolet light moving into X rays, gamma rays. This way, slightly lower is infrared radio waves, and we have that full spectrum. Because this is important for healing. Because for healing the physical body, especially. Um, there's healing in around here. So not just visible light, but I'm going to talk a bit about ultraviolet light and infrared light and their potentials for healing because we're starting to understand more about this. And just to say that from um, an esoteric point of view, as humanity raises its consciousness as a whole, so we will come to understand light and use light in our technology and our healing more and more. And it's good to see that we are already doing this. Um, and this is a sign that we are making progress spiritually, even if sometimes it doesn't seem like we are. So how light therapy works. So light hits, um, enters your eyes, 
and millions, there are millions of light and color sensitive cells called photoreceptors. And these convert the light into an electrical signal that goes through your optic nerve to your brain. And this is, this is how light therapy works. And when that signal, the optic nerve signal goes to a center in your brain called the hypothalamus, uh, that light sends chemical messengers or neurotransmitters from the hypothalamus out into your physical body. And the hypothalamus uh, regulates sort of the autonomic or the automatic body functions. So light affects things like our blood pressure, our body temperature, our breathing, our digestion, our sexual function, our circadian rhythms, which are like the rhythms, um, our sleeping and waking rhythms or our energy rhythms, uh, woman's cyclic rhythms, the cycles in our physical body. The light affects our mood, the hypothalamus affects mood, immunity and aging. So you can see that getting light, if it affects all of these functions in our body, is pretty important to us as human beings, to, if we want to be healthy and functioning optimally, that we get enough light and the right sort of light. And this is where science is really starting to understand. Um, so full spectrum light is the light you get when you're outside. Okay, so it's daylight. And what we're starting to find now is there's a correlation between how much daylight a person receives and their mood, their mental awareness. Um, some people get seasonal effectiveness disorder in the winter when they don't get enough natural light and it creates symptoms of depression. Um, full spectrum light actually uh, affects our ability to see things in color truly can affect things like your dental health, definitely your sleep quality. And something that's really important for health at the moment, it affects your vitamin D production. And we're starting to realize, especially with this pandemic, just how important vitamin D is. So many um, processes in the body require vitamin D and it's huge in keeping a strong and healthy immune system. And we're starting to find that people who have been quite susceptible to this virus, many of them have had a low vitamin D um, status because it is something that is stored in the liver. So you, if you get enough sunlight over the summer months, it should get you through the winter. Uh, but there are many things in our lifestyle now that deplete those stores and it's not as really it's not really available in our food source it's got to come from the light and with increasing um, pollution and and to be honest us messing with light and living lives indoors in artificial light we're starting to affect our health in this way so full spectrum light um it hits the pineal gland uh, that regulates hundreds of hormonal reactions in your body. Uh, but the probably most important one is the sleep cycle. Uh, and this was really a real revelation to me when I realized that the habits that you go through when you first wake up and before you go to sleep, make a huge difference to your energy levels in the day and to how, um, how good your sleep is, how nourishing and productive that sleep is. For example, when we first wake up in the morning, um, light, natural light, stimulates a hormone called cortisol. And once cortisol is stimulated, we feel awake, alert and ready for the day. Uh, and it switches off a hormone called melatonin, which tends to be the one that makes us feel relaxed and sleepy. Okay, so if you sort of wake up and then delay having any exposure to natural light, you're going to feel sluggish and sleepy for longer. So the habit of getting up when you wake up and opening the curtains or even going outside or exposing yourself to natural full spectrum light will naturally give you more energy. You'll be more awake and alert. Um, 
sleeping in is probably the worst thing you can do in terms of your energy in that way. And then this reverses at night. So at night, we want increasing levels of melatonin. So as nature closes down the daylight, um, there's a natural rhythm within us that starts to slow down. There's an increase in the production of melatonin and a decrease in the levels of cortisol. And we wind down from the day. And it's said that people who have a regular habit of winding down an hour before they go to sleep, shutting off sources of artificial light. Okay, and this is where if you're on your phone, on your computer till late at night, just before you go to sleep, um, it affects the quality of your sleep and how much time you spend down in the delta brainwave state and how restorative both mentally and physically that sleep is. And so I worry, you know, about we have a generation who are on their phones and their computers till they drop and then they're straight back on them when they wake up in the morning and what this is doing to health and to the quality of our sleep. So that's just an example. Um, and this is why many people use, for example, uh, alarm lamps that that mimic the room flooded in full spectrum light. Many people are putting full spectrum daylight bulbs in their house so that in the winter they're getting some exposure to full spectrum light. But really the best thing to do is to get outside, okay? Uh, even on a cloudy day. <laughs> There's... There's thousands of studies that, that support the need for full spectrum light for our health. Um, and then I wanna move into the ultraviolet light. Um, so remember, if we just look at the slide, the ultraviolet spectrum is just slightly increased energy, uh, increased wavelength from um, the light that we are used to seeing. So we're finding now that ultraviolet light, UV light, uh, reduces inflammation in the body. It improves healing, acne, skin condition called vitiligo, scar tissue, eczema, psoriasis, some skin cancers. But there's got to be a, a balance with overexposure because it's the, it's the ultraviolet light that can create and cause sunburn and um, skin damage and skin cancers. So most of the UV light um, in, our, in natural light is UVA with some UVB. All of the UVC is absorbed by our atmosphere. And UVA rays are slightly less intense than the UVB, but they penetrate the skin more deeply. Uh, and they can cause genetic damage to cells in the in, innermost top layer of your skin, which is where most skin cancers occur. And your skin tries to prevent this damage by darkening, resulting in a tan. UVB rays have more energy than the UVA and they damage the DNA in the skin directly and are the main rays that cause sunburn. They're also thought to be the more damaging ones in terms of skin cancer. But there's conflicting results in science at the moment because they're putting down, they're saying that part of our low vitamin D status is because people are wearing too much sunblock and not getting out and exposing their skin to the sunshine. So it's one of those things where it's very much a balance and it depends on what type of skin you have and where in the world you are. Um, remember that ultraviolet light and sunshine, you know, you can still have ultraviolet light on a cloudy day. Um, now, ultraviolet light, um, there's exploration into techniques in science, which I found quite uh, fascinating. For example, they're, they're experimenting with using ultraviolet light where they inject it into a person's veins to treat psoriasis from the inside or as a cure for Lyme's disease. Um, there's, there's also, um, we've got to be careful because ultraviolet light is damaging to the cornea in our eye and very definitely um, has a potential to cause cataracts. So again, it's about our exposure, about the length of our exposure, but not getting out in 
uh, natural light is definitely uh, has detrimental effects on our health. And there's that effect on our mood, remember, as well. Okay, so it's a balance. Now, they use UV light to, um, they're starting to investigate using it to irradiate blood irradiation to kill bacteria, yeasts, and viruses. So it has a vaccine like effect by allowing the immune system to work with these. Um, pathogens and build an appropriate immune response and it's totally safe and there are no adverse reactions or side effects so in the future instead of vaccinations we may just get a dose of uv light um, into our bloodstream um, the other source um, of light the infrared which was slightly to the other side of that visual spectrum is really exciting. Uh, infrared light helps cells to regenerate and repair themselves. So intraviolet infrared light, sorry, also include, in, uh, improves the circulation of oxygen rich blood in the body. So it promotes faster healing, uh, especially of deep tissues. And it's been used a lot for the management and eradication of pain it seems to work very well in muscle pain and joint stiffness and arthritic type conditions. So we see here, um, it boosts the immunity, used therapeutically. It's used quite a lot already. Uh, it's used in medicine and dentistry, uh, vets use it, and it is very safe. Um, the It's used in um, skin, purification. It's been found to, for example, lower the side effects of diabetes to, uh, it's been used in, in weight loss. All sorts of uses are being explored in science at the moment. And one of the things that I've read a bit about lately, which I found fascinating, we have little cells in our body that produce energy called mitochondria, little substances in the cells. And I was reading that from age 20 to 40, our mitochondria half. So would they halve? We have half as many and they tend to shrink and not be as big and powerful. So from 20 to 40, we've not got the same capacity to generate energy from the food we eat. And then the bad news is from 40 to 70, they halve again. But this is only in people who don't... Um, positively stress their body. Now, what do you say? What do you mean by positively stress? Our body, like our mind, like our emotional self, our physical body is supposed to be positively stressed and pushed out of its comfort zone uh, so that it grows stronger and develops. And they find that people who regularly positively stress their body, they don't see the same age-related changes in their mitochondria. And so they tend to keep the same energy levels from a young person to an older person. And we all know examples of very vibrant, energetic older people. And some of the ways that we can positively stress our physical body are, for example, yoga where you're just, you're, or, or Tai Chi or Qigong, anything that gives that um, prolonged stretch or that slightly increased stretch um, in the body. Things like um, fasting uh, positively stress the body. Things like uh, cold, uh, cold immersion. And I know it's very topical at the moment, um, with the man who likes to bathe in ice. Um, and I know for myself, just turning your shower to cold at the end um, really boosts your energy and is really good for your immune system. Bathing, you know, wild swimming, going swimming in cold water. But one of the ways, one of the other ways is heat uh, stress. So when the body is stressed via uh, exercise and, and there's the heat, but also infrared, and this is where things like infrared saunas, where the body is heat response or the whole sort, the idea of a sauna is stressing the body uh, through heat helps to keep these mitochondria numbers good and good and strong. So that's, I found that interesting and very definitely things that you can do 
um, to keep healthy into older age. Okay, laser light. Laser light, you're probably familiar with the use in especially um, laser eye surgery. And the brilliant thing about laser light is it, um, it, it's a beam that's so small and precise that allows healthcare providers to safely treat tissue without injuring the surrounding tissue. So it can be very precise. Uh, it's used in eye surgery to remove cataracts, to correct stigmatism, to remove a detached retina. It's used to shrink or destroy tumors, polyps, precancerous growth, removes kidney stones, treats hair loss, can treat especially back pain that's caused by nerve damage. It's also used as a cauterizing effect in sealing um, nerve endings to reduce pain after surgery, blood vessels to help prevent blood loss, lymph vessels to reduce swelling and limit the spread of tumor cells. So you can see that we're really advancing uh, in our understanding of the use of light in a traditional Western um, medical situation. Color therapy. So each color has a specific vibrational energy, and this affects us physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually through a principle in physics called the entrainment principle. And that is the idea that when we are exposed to a certain vibration, our body comes into tune or into entrainment with that vibration. And so color therapy, um, I mean, you will know that different colors can have a different effect on your mood, you know, red for rage, for passion, for hunger. It's why restaurants are often painted red, uh, blue for calm, contemplative peace. You know, the, the, the chakras have certain colors associated with their particular vibrations and healing of the chakra energies uh, color can be used to help to heal. Uh, there's also the antakarana, okay, the rainbow bridge that develops between the personality and the soul. And each of those rainbow colors is a result of lives where we've been uh, on certain in ray energies that have certain vibrations and colors, and we develop certain qualities and help to open that bridge and that communication so there's increased soul expression. Um, and now I want to move into um, just an understanding that um, light is vibration and that we heal by working with energy vibration. So I've talked a little bit about psychological healing when we shine that light of the conscious mind into the unconscious. We can use techniques like um, psychotherapy, hypnosis, meditation. You can work in this way. There's all sorts of ways in which you can um, access your unconscious mind. And then we look at something like our own capacity, um, Reiki and hands-on healing, where the human, a person who is trained, can act as a channel for healing light. And when uh, this is like a combination of, of drawing in the energies of light from the cosmos, but also that light is directed with the light of intention of the mind of the healer to bring about whatever is for the highest good for the person being healed. So this is working interactively in healing. Um, and what it does is, through opening up to being a channel for this healing light, we can heal others. And we do this by stimulating their body's own natural healing response. And the, our body has within it a desire or um, an intuitive process to come back to an optimum frequency in a state of what we call homeostasis, a state of optimum health and balance. And so letting the light come in will often bring a vibrational energy into the etheric body of the person that then takes that energy into the physical body and creates change. It creates a possibility and a potential for change. 
And I do Reiki healing myself. And I know that whenever I work with someone in Reiki, um, there's always emotional and mental realizations. So it's never just a physical or even an energetic, etheric healing process. There is always, you know, when your hand is over a person's heart chakra and um, you start to get a sense of, of what's going on, how blocked, how open, what's going on in their heart energy. And as you open up and allow that Reiki energy to come through, quite often the person will have some kind of realization, some kind of change in their perception of an event that has happened in the past and a block to uh, their, their heart energy will dissolve. There's often tears and healing on a very deep level. Um, so we do have this wonderful capacity to heal through our connection with each other. And this is very much to do with energy. It can be through sound or through light. Uh, but the important thing is that the healer becomes a channel, is trained in such a way that they become a pure open channel and nothing to do with their own personality self is involved. They become a channel for the soul energy. Um, there's also our understanding of the power of visualization and cell healing. So I mentioned that all the body cells are photoelectric. And because energy follows thought, um, people who go into a deep state of relaxation where their, their brain goes into what we call a theta brainwave state, if they can create very powerful visualizations in their mind, imagining a healing light, for example, going into different parts of their body and healing and bringing that part of their body back into balance. When um, they measure this, they found that a powerful visualization that has a physiological and a biochemical effect on the body. So we do have, we're starting to explore and understand this mind-body connection in terms of healing, and especially in visualizing light. There's something about visualizing light coming through, you know, pouring through your bloodstream, going into the different parts of you that need healing, that is very powerful. And we know that athletes have known for, we've known for years that if an athlete mentally rehearses with full vivid color and involving all the senses, a performance, when they come to do that performance, that there is a kinesthetic awareness that has been laid down in their mental programming. And it's as if they have been physically practicing. So we're just starting to understand. And this is, remember I said, when um, a person moves from the second initiation to the third initiation, there becomes an increasing capacity to create using thought to create using energy, to be a master of light. And this is an example of us starting to understand that process. And we work with this when we work in meditation or we do group work in a group meditation and we are envisaging you know, our planet surrounded by light and light infusing the minds and hearts of mankind. This is all working in this power of the lighted mind or the consciousness to direct the actual energy. There'll be an increasing development um, of etheric vision. More and more people will open um, as the heart centers open and the throat centers open, we'll get increasing numbers um, developing etheric vision and we'll start to see the world as it truly is because our eyes don't see quite the world uh, as it is. And this is exciting. Um, and also there'll be an increasing ability to see the light of the soul of another and as people start to see others as energetic beings, I, um, I always say to people, a person's energy field can't lie. 
Okay, they can say all sorts and they can tell you all sorts, but a person's energy vibration speaks their truth. It speaks how they are, how they are emotionally, mentally, what their intention is, where they are spiritually. And a person's energy cannot lie. And increasingly, as we start to be able to see energy, to see the energy interactions between people, we'll be able to see when someone is dominating another person as we see energy pouring out of this person and being sucked up by this person. And all of this will change and it will really accelerate the development of right relations between people. Um, and it's, it's something that will come and is increasingly coming. Um, and uh, I welcome, okay. We will see increasing medical diagnosis and treatment using light and especially starting to understand and use the light of crystals. Because in the mineral kingdom, the crystals are the fully enlightened, the crystals that radiate are the fully enlightened beings in their kingdom, okay? They are fully realized. And so we will start to understand that we can channel energy through crystals or we can be open to crystal energy and their capacity to heal. Uh, we'll start to use crystal energy and transportation in all sorts of ways. And this brings me to um, just mention that as our consciousness increases, at the moment, we live in a three-dimensional world and we are three-dimensional beings. As our vibration increases and increasing numbers of people come into full soul contact and radiate full soul light, we will actually shift into fourth and fifth dimension, becoming fourth and fifth dimensional beings. We will no longer need to be physical. Um, we will start to become the truth of who we are, which is we are beings of light. And this light is just residing in this dense physical <laughs> form. And this is exciting um, as people learn about energy vibrations and learn about what lowers energy vibrations and what raises energy vibrations. And they start to see life and interaction between people uh, as energy. And psychic surgery, there will come a time when we look back at the time now where we used to actually physically invade the physical body in surgery as the dark ages, because they'll come and it's already coming when we will use psychic surgery, we'll use our mind and the power, you know, lasers are the beginning toward um, psychic surgery. And I watched an amazing YouTube video of... Um, and I haven't been able to find it. It was years ago. An Asian woman had a tumor and they had an ultrasound monitoring um, this tumor. And three um, medical healers, trained healers, were just working with this woman and sending her healing energy. And their intention was that the healing would be for her highest good, whatever that was. And she was very relaxed and open. Um, and as we watched, it was about a 20 minute video, you watched on the ultrasound scan, you watched this tumor shrink um, through the power of their combined. And this is something that's working in groups. We have a certain capacity as individuals, but when we work in groups, it's, it's logarithmic. We have enormous capacity to help heal others. And I watched this tumor shrink and this, this woman um, was just calm, very open. And this is the sort of thing that will happen in the future. We will start to use the mind in this way because we have capacities that we, we don't even realize that we have. We know that we're already, as our consciousness increases and we increasingly understand light, we're using it in our computer technology. The internet is based on light. We're using, you know, our phones are based on light technology. Um, there will be a renaissance in art that uses light. 
Um, and we're already starting to see this in digital art and some of the amazing things that people are starting to work with. We will, um, we already have celebrations of light. You know, we celebrate solstice, we celebrate Diwali, candles have a, um, a spiritual significance. We have an increasing um, desire as the seventh ray comes in to, to involve light in a ceremonial way, to bring about, to bring in more light, to bring in the order that, um, that light brings. So just as I finish, because I've presented a lot of information there, um, <clears throat> I just want to pull it all together and say that you are a being of light. That is your essence. And at this moment in time where we are, you can probably think of light as truth. Okay, your soul, your soul is truth, beauty, and goodness. And that truth is the light. That is the illumination. So whenever you are in touch with the highest part of you, whenever you lift up into that higher self, into connection with your soul, you lift up into seeing the truth of a situation. And we are terribly scared of our light. We would rather sink down into the lower vibrations of fear and doubt and following what other people tell us and not lifting up into that light. But as Maya Angelou says, there's nothing can dim the light that shines from within you because it is one with the light that is everywhere, that is all. And that is the light of consciousness. So if this talk does nothing else, I hope that you understand um, that we are light beings and quite what that means. Thank you very much.